Hello, this is Wild Quidditch, and today I'm going to talk about our work on our based triple convection framework for Apache R6DB. Data analysts usually want to analyze data from external sources, and the user may not have the access or the control to of the structure of the data. Thus, the analyst uses some sort of a schemaless database for storing and querying the data. Why a schemaless store? Well, the web services community has studied the changes of popular APIs. What they found uh, is that those API can change frequently and drastically over time. For instance, a value type could change from a string to an array of strings. And sometimes those changes can happen daily without a notice. The flexibility of a schema store is not free, however. In this example, we store the same data using a schemaless JSON data model and the relational data model. The JSON record here is four times larger than the relational record. This is because we need to store the schema within each record. For instance, we need three bytes to store the field name ID, and one byte for the type tag, and four bytes for the value itself. Whereas in the relational model, the schema information is stored in a centralized catalog. So, is there a way where we can reduce the gap between the relational model and the JSON model in terms of storage overhead? The outline of this talk is structured as follows. First, we give an overview of our test bed system, Apache S6DB. Next, we zoom in into our contributions, where we give an overview of a lesson-based tuple convection framework. And then we briefly go through our convection-friendly record format, the vector-based format. Then we show the results of our experiment, and finally, the conclusion. S6DB is a big data management system that runs on a shared nothing commodity cluster and capable of storing, indexing, and querying large volume of semi-structured data. S6DB allows us to define a schema for JSON-like data where the user can declare none, some, or all the fields. Also, the user can specify whether to accept or reject additional fields by declaring the types as open or closed. Declaring all fields can impact the storage size and the query performance. In 2015, a study showed that by declaring the schema, the storage size has been reduced by 50% and the query execution time reduced by the same factor. So, can we get the same storage savings without the restrictions of explicitly declaring the schema? Before answering this question, I will briefly explain the storage engine of Apache S6DB. S6DB storage engine is a log-structured merge tree-based engine. Lesson tree is a disk-based data structure designed to address the challenges of write-intensive workloads. LSM has two components, a memory component, which stores records in memory, and others components, which stores records on disk. LSM has two operations. The first one is the flush, which takes a memory component and writes it to on-disk component. The merge operation, which takes two or more on disk components and merge them into a single on disk component. So how our SixCDB handles incoming data? When data arrives to the system, it, the records get inserted into the, into the in-memory component. Once the in-memory component is full, the LSM tree manager triggers a flush operation, which writes the record of the in-memory components to a disk sequentially into on disk component, during which the records cannot be modified. In the flush operation, we observe that the records of flushed components are immutable. Flush operation is done by a single thread to ensure sequential and ordered write. We can see there is an opportunity here. Before writing the record to disk, we can transform them into more compacted form. Also, we can do so without any concurrency challenges. And that actually leads us to the first contribution. The Tuba Compactor is a framework that exploits LSM lifecycle events to infer the schema and compact the records during data ingestion. Let's take an example. We will want to analyze data set about employees. So we first declare the type. And here, we only declare the primary key of the data set, which is the ID. In the last three lines, we tell us XTP to compact the record. So what happens when, the, when we enable the Tuba Compactor? We start data ingestion. The records come to the system as declared. We see here that data has two additional fields. First is the name and second is the age, which we didn't specify in our schema and both fields are self-describing, which means the field names and types are stored within each record. As in the normal operation, the data gets inserted as is without any transformation into the memory component. Once the memory component is full, the record gets flushed to the disk into a new disk component. Before doing so, we take this opportunity to infer and extract the schema from the flushed record and write them into a compacted form into a new on-disk component. 
Once the flush is done, we persist the inferred schema into the metadata page of the flush component. When the next batch of data comes to the system, we do the same. The data gets inserted into the memory component and then gets flushed into a new disk component. However, in this example, we see that the age is of type string. So the tuple compacted changes the type of age from integer to a unit of integer and string. So what happens when we merge two disk components with two different schemas? We see that the latest schema S1 is a superset of all previous schemas. So we only write the schema of the latest component into the newly created component. This is basically the workflow of the tuple compactor. Zooming in, here is how we store the inferred schema. On the left, we get a data in a raw format. We see that we have multiple feeds, some are primitives and some are nested. The three schema structure on the right gives us a summary about the structure of the ingested data. We store the field names separately as a dictionary, which allows us to canonicalize similar field names. The question now is how we actually do the compaction, and this is where we explain the vector-based record format. The main objective of the vector-based format is to make the schema inference and the compaction process as efficient as possible. As the name suggests, we store the record as vectors. The vector-based have four main vectors, values tags vectors, fixed length and variable length vectors, and finally, the field names vector. This is an example of a record in the vector-based format. We see the record in a raw format in the middle, and the tags vector above, the values and the field names vectors are below. In this talk, we will focus on how this uh, format aids us to infer the schema and compact the record efficiently. We refer the audience to our paper for more details. In the vector based format, we see that the tags and the field names are basically the record metadata. So to infer the schema, we only need to scan those two vectors without touching the values, which makes the schema inference process easy and efficient. The compaction process here is replacing the field name strings with field name IDs which can be done efficiently without impacting the ingestion performance. Next, we're going to talk about our experiments. This is the setup of our experiments and presented in this talk. More experiment setup is explained in the paper. The machine we use has eight physical core and 16 logical ones with 32 gigabytes of memory. We use two storage devices, SAT SSD and NVMe SSD, each of which has different read and write throughputs. We use two data sets. The first data set has 200 gigabytes of tweets, and the other one is, has 200, 122 gigabytes of sensors reading. The Twitter data set is mostly string, and the sensors data is mostly numeric. In our experiment, we compare three data set types referred as I6DB open, where we only declare the primary key, I6DB closed, where we declare all the fields, and finally, the vector base inferred, which utilizes our tuple compactor framework to infer the schema and compact the record. Also, we compare the impact of page level compression using snappy compression scheme as a way to reduce the storage overhead. As can be seen, the inferred dataset types has a smaller storage overhead compared to the other two. Even after the compression, the inferred dataset has the smallest storage overhead. This is because the vector-based format is smaller in terms of size when compared to the S6DB's original cursor structure of the open and closed types. To measure the impact of the tubal compactor on ingestion, we see that the tubal compactor didn't negatively impact the ingestion time. In the contrary, the ingestion time was improved. This is because the vector based format is more efficient to construct compared to the cursive structure of Y6DB. The closed dataset type took more time to enforce the constraints of the declared fields, such as checking for missing non nullable fields. When we query the Twitter dataset, we see here that the query execution time against the inferred dataset type took less time to execute in this SSD. However, after the compression, the differences between the inferred and closed type become negligible in the NVMe SSD due to the high reading throughput. In the sensors dataset, which mostly numeric values, query the inferred dataset type to list time compared to the other two. This is due to the smaller storage overhead in the vector-based format, and which was more suitable for numerical values as we detail thoroughly in the paper. In conclusion, the tuple compactor framework addresses the storage overhead issue of storing self-describing records by inferring the schema and compacting the records. Using the vector-based format, we were able to do so without hurting the ingestion rate. In fact, we were able to improve the S6DB ingestion's performance. The syntactic approach of compression and the semantic approach of compacting other records, both of which helped us to reduce the storage overhead size by 9x and improved the query execution time by the same factor.
Thank you.